Hello, hello, hello. This is Mr. Math, your chess instructor. In this video, we'll be reviewing and analyzing one of the most famous games of all time, Anderson vs. Kizaritsky, also known as the Immortal Game. For some background information, this was a casual game played following a tournament uh, in London in 1851. Adolf Anderson was one of the best players of his time, and he showed it dur during both the year and the tournament beating renowned players such as Max Lange and Staunton. While he was never crowned world champion, he was considered the strongest player in the world, with his main notable losses only being to Paul Morphy in 1858 and the eventual first world chess champion, Wilhelm Steinitz, in 1866. Lionel Kizaritsky was also quite a strong player, having also beaten multiple strong players at the time, although albeit not as many or as strong as Anderson had. Anderson and Kizaritsky played in the first round of the 1851 London tournament, a round which Anderson won. This following game, however, despite being a casual game that was played after the fact, has been far better recorded and remembered for its amazing demonstration of just how much material a player can be down and still win should they follow principles and be aware of tactics. Once again, let's quickly review the things that one should do and avoid doing in the opening. The three goals we've discussed in previous videos are controlling the center, developing pieces, and getting the king to safety. Two of the things we've talked about avoiding are moving the same piece twice, as well as bringing the queen out too early. Similarly to last video, try to keep those concepts in your mind as we go through this game. Anderson played white in this game, and Kizaritsky played black. We have e4, e5, and now, an opening I haven't discussed in depth on the channel yet, f4. This is known as the King's Gambit, and was a particularly popular opening during this time period. The basic idea is that white tries to give up a pawn, enticing black to play e captures f4. In exchange, however, by deflecting the black pawn off of e5, white gains an advantage with regards to one of uh, the three following goals controlling the center, as black's pawn no longer controls the d4 square. For this reason, most modern players actually prefer black to play d5 here, immediately striking back in the center rather than taking the pawn for short-term material gain. However, Kazaritsky took the obvious approach with e captures d4, and Anderson immediately got to work on improving his central control with bishop c4. This move serves a trio of purposes. Anderson develops the bishop, guards d5 to prevent black from placing a pawn there, and also provokes black's next move, queen h4 check, attacking the king, and now king f1. Now we see that Kazaritsky violated an opening principle by moving the queen too early in order to prevent white from completing their own opening principle by forcing white's king to move and therefore preventing castling. However, with Anderson's superior central control, he will soon see, uh, we will soon see, soon see that black's violation will matter far more than white's. Kizaritsky now plays b5, trying to deflect white's bishop from targeting b5, uh, d5 rather, and also the weak square f7. And that Anderson takes. Black plays knight f6, and now we begin to see the problem with bringing the queen out so early, knight f3. Anderson now develops a piece with an attack, also known as developing with tempo, forcing black to waste time moving his queen, queen h6. And now d3. We can already start to see how white is developing rapidly, while black's pieces, in particular his queen, are lacking in scope. Kizaritsky now played knight h5. This move breaks another principle. Black moves the same piece twice in the opening. However, Kizaritsky was a master of the game and had an interesting tactical justification for the move. Can you figure out what Kizaritsky was plotting here? Pause the video, take your time, and unpause when you're ready. Alright, as it turns out, Kizaritsky had quite an interesting tactic in mind, combining the use of not one, but two of our three basic tactics, forks, pins, and skewers. In this case, the relevant tactics are the fork and the pin. 
The first noticeable fork for black is knight g3, forking the king and the rook. However, the knight here can simply be captured. Or can it? Let's say white plays a3, just a throwaway move, knight g3. Can white's pawn capture the knight on g3? As it turns out, no, because moving the knight has opened up the queen to pin the pawn on h2. And so this would combine a fork and a pin to win a rook for a knight. Nice job if you saw his plans. However, if you saw his plans, what did you think you could do to evade them? Hopefully not king g1, as this wouldn't work because of queen b6 check forking the king and the bishop, and black would still win a piece due to yet another fork. Anderson instead came up with the idea knight h4, blocking the pin such that after knight, h3, knight g3, white could simply capture. And so now, Kazersky tried a different fork with g5, forking the knight and the bishop, but of course Anderson had seen this coming, knight f5, blocking. Kazersky now attempted to kick Anderson's bishop with c6, to which we had a counterattack, g4, counterattacking the knight on h5, knight f6. But now Anderson faces a problem. The b5 bishop is under attack, and the g4 pawn is also attacked twice and defended only once. So did Anderson blunder? No. Rook g1. Anderson gives up his bishop entirely, but he does so with the intent to fully capitalize on black's mistake of bringing the queen out so early. And now after c captures b5, we have h4, queen g6, h5, queen g5, and now queen f3. And notice how the wayward black queen is now stuck. White threatens, bishop takes f4, and the queen would be trapped. The pawn covers g6, the knight covers h6, and also h4. So, Kizaritsky's only way of making room for the queen to escape is to undevelop the knight. Knight g8, bishop takes f4, queen f6, knight c3. And we can now see visually just how much of an advantage white has gotten from the opening. He is almost completely developed, has a relatively safe king compared to blacks, and has full control of the center. All this at the cost of a bishop. Now, Kazariski played bishop c5, doing what little he could to fight for control of the center. Here, an analysis after the game showed that Anderson could have played the simple yet amazing looking b4. At first, it looks like black could just take on d4 here. However, as it turns out, this move would be very unsafe. How could white win material here? There are two ways to do so. Pause the video, take your time, and see if you can find either one or both. All right, so as mentioned, there are two ways for white to win material here. The first obvious one is knight d5, taking advantage of the fact that black has very little space to maneuver. By attacking black's queen, which is the only defender of black's bishop, it's forced to move. And as it turns out, there's no safe square to move to that also defends the bishop. Queen a5 is met, of course, by the bishop, and queen b6 is met by the knight. And so here, black would be forced to retreat and therefore lose the bishop. White's other, more complex way of winning material is knight d6 check. And as it turns out, None of the three squares the king can move to are safe. If king e7, knight d5 forks the king and the queen. If king d8, bishop g5, pinning the queen to the king, preventing it from capturing the queen on f3, black's only option to save the queen is queen takes g5, and now knight takes f7 check would be a fork, once again winning the queen. And finally, if king f8, knight d5 again. And now, it, rather than the king with no safe squares, it's the queen with no safe squares. If queen h5, knight f5 will fork the bishop and the queen. If queen e6, knight c7 will fork the queen and the rook. 
And if queen d8, bishop e5 attacking the bishop. And if black takes, there is a discovery of checkmate. So nice job if you saw knight d5 to win the bishop. And an especially good job if you found knight d6 check followed by only all the lines mentioned. Anderson, however, went for a more explosive approach in the game. Knight d5 immediately. Anderson was trying to set up a mating net as quickly as possible, or in other words, to prepare to attack and deliver checkmates. However, by not playing d4, Kizaritsky got the chance to play queen captures b2. Now, both of white's rooks are under attack, and yet, the attack must go on. Bishop d6. Anderson understands that once material has been sacrificed and the center has been controlled, the next logical step is to attack. It won't matter that white loses both of his rooks after all if he lands checkmate. Bishop captures g1. Does white recapture the bishop? No, every single move must count e5. Anderson cuts off the last remaining piece from being able to come to the defense of black's king, the queen. And now, the mating net has been set around black's king. King takes a one, queen takes a one check, king e2. And now Anderson has a mate threat. Knight takes g7 check, the bishop blocks e7 and f8, king d8, and now bishop c7 would be checkmate. So, g7 is indefensible, so Kisariski finds knight a6, defending the c7 square instead. And now knight takes g7 check, king d8. So now bishop c7 is no longer checkmate since it's guarded by the knight. However, despite that, Anderson from here delivered mate in just two moves. Can you find it? If you watched last video's historical game, that should give you a hint of how this one ended too. So take again, take your time, pause the video, and unpause when you're ready. All right, besides bishop c7, there's also bishop e7, which would also be checkmate. However, just like c7, e7 is guarded by one black piece, and that's the knight on g8. However, unlike the knight on a6, the knight on g8 can be forced away from its post. Queen f6. Just as in Morphe versus Duke, Anderson sacrifices the queen to deflect the knight. Knight takes f6, and now bishop e7 is checkmate. In the final position, Anderson is down a queen, two rooks, and a bishop. And yet, he wins. So that was the Immortals game, Anderson versus Kitsuritsky. In summary, Anderson gave a great example of how to play a gambit. He sacrificed material to gain advantages in terms of opening principles, as well as to delay his opponent's opening principles. In the middle game, he used the development and central control he had gained to advance on the opposing king, eventually encircling in a mating net and delivering checkmate. In the final position, every last one of white's remaining bishops and knights are participating in checkmating the black king. While every single one of black's pieces, besides the knight on f6, which was just deflected out, is stuck on one of the four sides of the board, doing nothing at all. Again, if you want to learn more about openings or tactics, I've got videos on this channel dedicated to both of those topics. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you all next class.